So I hope that I nevertheless can contribute also a little bit to real mathematics, not just to fundraising and uh, this stuff. So my topic is certainly not really in the main core of your conference, but uh, okay, it's a construction of a space of all metric measure space, and uh, it's not mainly for interest in constructing this abstract object, but the impressive result is that this abstract space has nice properties. So let me try to explain a little bit what is the historical uh, approach to this and what is the reason to study this. So geometric analysis and uh, yeah, many other questions deal with Riemannian manifolds. So this is the space on which you have heat equation, on which you have Brownian motion, on which you can uh, do spectral calculus. For several questions, it turned already out uh, many decades ago that it's more natural or it leads to a situation where you do, don't have smoothness. And nevertheless, you can do nice geometry. And this is the framework of Alexandrov spaces where you extend uh, bounds on the sectional curvature towards inequalities for triangles or squares of, or angles, whatever. And there are two kind of uh, spaces, two kind of two classes. The spaces with lower curvature bound, the spaces with upper curvature bounds. The de definitions look very similar. Uh, in the spirit of my talk, it is more for spaces with a lower curvature bounds, which are of interest. The spaces with upper curvature bounds are really much more general than manifolds. The spaces with lower curvature bounds are, in many respects, very similar to manifolds. In particular, if they are finite dimensional. If they are finite dimensional and have this Alexandrov curvature bound from below, then there are manifolds up to a small set of bad points. And this small set is a measure zero set, and even better, it's a capacity zero set. So in the sense of potential theory, stochastic calculus, this, this does not play such a big role. But sectional curvature does not really play such an important role in analysis. So if you do analysis, then the appropriate assumption is a lower bound on the Ricci curvature. So it's the trace of a sectional curvature. So you would expect that you have a more general framework, more general theory, if you impose uh, section, uh, Ricci curvature bounds. And this was open for quite a while. So whereas this was uh, already developed more than 50 years ago, this is just a theory which was developed 10 years ago, uh, mainly by Lord Villani and myself. So the theory of metric measure space, which have lower Ricci bounds. Again, this is a very nice class of spaces, but uh, for instance, if you might be interested in curvature flows, this has, again, a kind of lack of natural construction because if you start something under Ricci flow, the Ricci bound is not preserved. So if you start with a class which, has, which is only defined in terms of its Ricci bound, you start a flow and immediately you are out of its space. And there are many other reasons why it might also make sense to, to study evolutions, dynamic in an in a even bigger space. One reason is that there is also a very interesting theory of uh, metric graphs. So you start with finite graphs and you want to, to study uh, limits of, of metric graphs. And there is a reason, there are a lot of recent work by, by Box, Chase, Lovac, Elik, uh, Varshik. And uh, there are also other metric measure spaces which show up as, as limits of universality constructions, uh, either in the sense of uh, SLE or in the sense of Legal and Mirmor, where you start with a random triangulation of a sphere and you, you ask for limits of the sequence of random triangulations. Okay, what is the short meaning of this long introduction? It makes sense to study the space of metric measure space. And it turns out that the space of metric measure space is a metric space with a nice metric. In particular, the main theorem in some sense is this metric is a metric of non-negative curvature. And if it's a metric of non-negative curvature, without any, new uh, without any new proof, we know the existence of gradient flows. If we have a semi-convex function, if you have a let's say Lipschitz continuous semi-convex function, then in this space, gradient flows for these functions are well defined. Of course, we should not expect that this is like Ricci flow, because Ricci flow is not a semi-convex function on such a 
abstract space, but perhaps functionals which are similar in, in some respect. Okay, now let me be a little bit more precise. What is a metric measure space in this setting? A metric measure space is a triple consisting of a, of a complete, or it's, it's a complete separable metric space. This is the XT, and then the D induces a topology, the topology induces a sigma field, and on the sigma field we have a Borel probability measure, measure on the sigma field induced by the metric. So this is just the metric triple of Kromov, Varishik, and, and other people, which is well studied since decades. The objects which we are really interested in are not particular metric measure space, but isomorphism classes. So two metric measure spaces are isomorphic if there is a bijection between the supports of a space, so if parts of a space do not have mass, they are just ignored. So this is one natural requirement, otherwise uh, it would not be a consistent theory. So if these are bijections between su the supports which um, push forward for a measure and pull back for distance. So under this map, the two spaces look the same. And now we look on the space of isomorphism class. I, I use this uh, square brackets for the classes. So these round brackets are individual representatives. These are the classes. And curly X is the space of class. Uh, sorry, curly X is one, one uh, uh, class, and, and bold face X naught is the space of classes. And we have one requirement that the size of the space should be finite. So we ask for the LP size to be finite, and LP size is just the LP mean of a distance. You choose just, a probabilist would say you choose randomly two points and measure the distance. And L infinity size would be for diameter. This is what typically is used in, in geometry, but here in this setting, it's more of a LP version. I should say the message of this talk is if you choose P between one and infinity, it's a really very interesting theory, in particular for P equal two. For P equal infinity or P equal zero, it's more towards things which have been studied before. But the power comes if you choose really a Hilbert's norm of for this. And now, what is the distance between metric measure space? This depends on, on the idea of optimal coupling. So first of all, if we have two spaces, x0 and x1, we try to identify points. And so this idea of coupling is a, is a generalization of, uh, for instance, of this epsilon isometrist used for chrome of house of distance. Uh, instead of epsilon isometrist, we use measures on the product space, and these measures should be thought as generalizations of bijections. Now sometimes this point does not really, uh, is, not, is not married to just one point. Actually this point could be married to five points here, which I suppress on, on the slide here. And this is the idea of coupling. It's, it's not really a bijection between points, but you should think that this is the natural generalization of bijections, and typically you don't have bijections. So uh, what you are looking for is a measure on the product space such that projecting into the first component, you get the measure on x0. Projecting it on the space x1, you get m1. This is just the idea of coupling. Uh, in terms of random variables, you say you have a random variable here, you have a random variable there, and you look for a joint distribution where you have the freedom to make this dependent, independent, whatever you want. The advantage of not studying bijections is that you always have a coupling. Namely, for product measure, for instance, is a coupling. It's certainly not the coupling which is typically used. And if you have a nice map F which pushes forward the measure from one space to the other one, then you also obtain a coupling by pushing forward identity and F. So this is one way. Whenever you have this classical way of transporting mass from here to here, uh, also this will be a situation. And this coupling is uh, well studied in on a fixed space, so this is all what is related with Kantorovich, Rubinstein, Wasserstein distance, and so forth. So whenever you are on, let's say, on Euclidean space, but you can do it on every metric measures, uh, on, on every complete metric space, let's say, uh, if you have two probability measures, mu and nu, you define for LP Wasserstein distance, and of course, uh, most of you know that really the contribution here comes essentially from, from Kantorovich. Uh, you ask for the LP distance between randomly chosen points in this product space, 
and randomly chosen according to this coupling. So more explicitly, you should think Q is a, is a distribution on pairs of points. Let's say if this is a distribution of producers, this is a distribution of consumers, and you ask for pairs between consumer and producer, and this is the distance from the producer to the consumer, and you want to minimize the LP distance. And one coupling is a product coupling, but if you want to minimize this distance, you should ask for a distance which is close to the diagonal. And a distance close to the diagonal typically looks like that. This is a result of Grenier, uh, namely the optimal coupling sits on the graph of a function. So this is just a, a short introduction. Now, we define our distance as follows, and I should write this distance also on the blackboard uh, because this might be important to re remember this. So if you have two spaces, uh, x0 and x1, you define the distance between, I abbreviate this here with x1, as the infimum over all couplings of this uh, double integral. And the idea behind that is you choose randomly two points in the space x0. And you ask how much do you ch have to change the distance if you switch from the space x0 to the space x1. So this is the distortion of a distance from space x0 to space x1. So it's the distortion, and you do not ask for the L infinity, which was, would be the classical definition of a distortion. You ask for the LP, mean of this distortion. And to give a meaning to that, you have to choose four points, two points in space x0, two, pay, two points in space x1. And you choose them always in pairs. This is the idea of this coupling. Not choosing this x0 means that you always also choose immediately a x1. Choosing this y0 means that at the same time you have a y1 because you choose them as pairs. This is the distortion distance. And of course, you try to minimize that. So you take the best coupling, uh, and it turns out, indeed, there exists the best coupling. You always have an optimal coupling. This would be not the case if you, if you ask uh, for bijections or whatever kind of epsilon isometry. And it turns out that this, with this distance, the space of metric measure space is a separate metric space. It also turns out that this is not a complete space. So this will be a question which we address later. What is the completion of this? And it also turns out that this distance does not depend that much on P. So there is also L0 version, so people from probability theory would recognize that this is a kind of Kaifan metric, Kaifan metric, uh, which, which is a metric for stochastic convergence, whereas this is a P convergence. So you can, in some sense, make this independent of P, or if it depends on P, only depends on the, on the uh, convergence of a, of a size, which is a very robust quantity. So in a topological sense, you could say, okay, if this is essentially independent of P, besides some integrability conditions. Therefore, all these concepts are very much in, in, in what we know also for measured form of Hausdorff convergence. Uh, I don't think that I have a slide here. So uh, at least for bounded sets, if, if you have a uniform bound for all these spaces, then this convergence here is equivalent to a measured com of house of convergence. Uh, no, more precisely to this, to com of Spock's metric, which is not exactly measured com of house stuff, but uh, let's say this is equivalent to convergence in, in, in com of uh, box metric. But in spirit, the same as measured com of house stuff. Now, for some reasons, it also turns out not only to introduce this metric, but also to look on a slightly different version, namely to look on the LP mean of the distance to the power Q. Well, it's not obvious why this should uh, be more interesting, but on the other hand, uh, in some sense, what, what was valid until now will also be valid with a Q different from one. Why do we introduce the Q? Because it turns out that for each P and Q, this is a geodesic space, and the geodesics always look as follows. So this, the geodesics between two spaces, x0 and x1, 
They are isomorphism classes which can be represented by the following space. The state space is the product of these two spaces. You have one choice of optimal coupling, which is not unique, but at least one ex will exist. And whenever this is chosen, the, the rest is uh, well defined. So the metric is just the convex combination, or let's say the d to the q, the q power of a distance is the convex combination of the q power of the distances. So if Q is 1, you just take the linear, uh, the convex combination of the distances. And in some sense, from Riemannian point of view, it's more interesting to take Q equal 2 here, because this means you take a convex combination of distance squares. So it doesn't depend on Q. It just, it does not, uh, this does not depend on P, but the choice of the, opt of the optimality of a coupling depends on P. Uh, okay, first of all, with this distance, we have a geodesic space, yeah? And geodesic is different for different p. And the statement here is, uh, whenever you choose an optimal coupling, where optimality depends on p. Whenever you have an optimal coupling, this will give a geodesic. For 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 the choice of a coupling, to 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 decide, yeah, yeah, but, not but not. So this is a very linear construction. Yeah, this is this is just convex combination. Oh, what is a geodesic and a geodesic? No, it's uh, geodesic. In my talk, are always globally minimizer of a distance. I I don't have other stuff. Every uh, geodesic always means distance minimizing on the whole domain of definition. And so this will be a geodesic. And if p is strictly between 1 and infinity, each geodesic looks like that, where the only freedom is the choice of an optimal coupling, which might be unique depending on the marginals and might be non-unique. Non -unique. Typically, I, OK, I just don't know what is typically. but. Uh, this is very reason work, so, so many things are not, not understood here. And I, I learned from, from Brenier, I met him just a few weeks ago, uh, and we discussed a little bit of this stuff. Even if you have a, a space consisting of, of endpoints here and endpoints there, this minimization problem uh, is regarded in, in uh, uh, optimization as one of uh, uh, hard problems. So be, because it's, it's quadratic in this coupling. If it would be linear infer coupling, then it's just convex analysis. You have duality theory and so forth. But since this coupling shows up twice, it's uh, very hard to get a structure of, uh, within the space of minimizers. So there's no shock theory or something like that behind. At least I do not understand too much. Uh, I want to say that this is uh, in your brackets a class of yeah. No, but, but, but my space, this space, the elements of this space are always classes. Ah, okay. Each element, so this is a space of isomorphism class of ah. magic measure spaces. Ah. And I can write down one representative, and actually this representation is true only for t strict between 1 and 0, because for t... Uh, Yes, yes. But, but class in particular means, and, and this might be important, the class, for instance, if this is x0 and this is x1, now formally, you would think we now have defined a space which is two-dimensional. But the choice of this measure, which typically yeah. looks like that, means you should have in mind that this is an equivalence class where there could be a lot of of space which has no mass. So in this sense, this space is isomorphic to the, to the support of this measure. And therefore, if you, if you take the interpolation of an n-dimensional manifold in a 
another n-dimensional manifold. First of all, you end up in two n-dimensional space. The measure lives on whatever space. A priori, we don't have good information, but from the premier result in the simpler optimization problem, we expect that for nice spaces, the measure is supported again on a, on a reasonable function, on the graph of a reasonable function. So this would be then this class. And No, uh, okay, I'm not an expert in this question. I think the expert in this question are here, but as far as I understand this problem, uh, I, we do not run into problem in uh, exactly because we study here isomorphism classes. We have, we have a logic problem to consider the metric space of metric spaces, like the set of sets, whether this is an allowed construction. But, but it's not really for a metric space of metric spaces, it's for a metric space of isomorphism. And actually, you can put a measure on this space, yeah? then you have a metric measure space of all metric measure space. But, but it's an isomorphism. It's, it's the first metric measure space of, of isomorphism classes. And then. Yeah. Where if this optimal coupling is unique or where it does not depend on P, you mean? On M, M bar. M bar. On yeah, yeah. M bar of the geometric. How do you understand In discrete cases where we really can calculate things, there are certainly typi the typical example would produce solutions where you only have one M bar. But typically finite dimension. But there is not really a, such a good theory as in the classical optimal transportation theory because in classical optimal transportation you have just one measure. And now you, you have this, this product. So you, all convexity breaks down. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But the, the, uniqueness, the uniqueness comes from the coupling. And, and I also can point out, but this is not such a deep point, but for me at, at least, but perhaps uh, you might be confused by that. So this description is true only in the open interval between zero and t, because for t equal zero and one, this is not a distance on this space. And therefore, for t equal zero and one, the representation of a class will change. We have to change to the space x naught, because Right now, we assume the distance to be a real distance. If we go to the completion, we will give up this. OK, uh, this is now a short discussion why the case Q equal 2 is in interesting. Um, OK, this really depends a little bit on your interest. So this is interesting because it preserves rough version of sectional curvature bounds. So what is a rough version? I call it here quadruple or quadrilateral curvature, perhaps I should start with this slide. Let, let, let me start with these two uh, theorems. There's a reason, there are recent results by Lebedeva, Petunin, and Berg Nikolaev, which characterize uh, this Alexandrov curvature bounds in terms of uh, quadruple inequality. Of course, it is known since, since decades that four points are sufficient to characterize curvature, but these are now very explicit simple formulas. So a geodesic space has non-negative curvature if and only if this inequality holds true. And for those who are not familiar with this inequality, for this first inequality, you should have in mind that the x naught is in some sense the center of mass of three points. So this would be the, the case where you achieve a minimum. And you estimate on the left side, you take the square of these distances. And the right-hand side are the squares of these distances. And if this inequality is true, you have non-negative curvature. And a similar characterization is, holds true for, for non-positive curvature, but with a different picture. I will make the picture, and then I put down the blackboard again. Here, you should think of the following picture. You have four 
points again, but now each of them in the same uh, position in some sense, and you add up the square of these sides, and you estimate them against the square of the diagonals. And if you have this inequality, then this, if you have this inequality for each quadruple, then and only then you have non-negative, uh, you have non-positive curvature. Okay, why is this kind of inequality nice for all this transportation business? It's nice for various reasons. First of all, if you are in one space and if you pass from the space to the classical L2 Wasserstein space, it simply means you integrate out these inequalities with respect to measures. And then you get the curvature inequalities for measures. So this is, for instance, the core for the proof that the L2 Wasserstein space on Euclidean space is non-negatively curved. And now we pass to spaces of metric measure spaces. And if you look on this inequality, if you have a convex combination of distance square, then you have a space x0, which satisfies this. You have a space x1, which satisfies this. You make a convex con combination, it's true again. The same here. If you have this inequality on x0, you have this inequality on x1, make the convex combination, you're done. What is not preserved is the geodesic property, and this can be seen in this picture. If you make a, this space, because geodesic in this intrinsic sense would mean the support of a measure is a geodesic space. So this space is a, is a huge representative, would be geodesic, but the uh, intrinsic definition should be that the support of a measure is geodesic, and this is not preserved, unfortunately. Because typically we do not know whether this uh, optimal coupling is in such a way that it's supported by a convex set or something like that. And therefore, this is not really Alexandrov curvature, this is just this quadruple inequality. But the quadruple inequality in, is, is preserved under this geodesic interpolation. And now, the idea behind that is you should, or one might be interested if one wants to go towards Riemannian geometry, that one does this kind of interpolation on small space scales. Okay, but this is, this is just why one is interested in, or why one might be interested. So this was for q equal two, and now we look on the, on the case p equal two. And this is the more interesting from my point of view. p equal two, where we have essentially a, LP, a L2 norm of something, and this is the uh, important, or has the important consequence, that then the space of this metric measure space has non-negative curvature, independent of a Q. You choose one Q, and then, and this is really a, a space of non-negative curvature in the sense that it's geodesic, it satisfies the triangle comparison condition, or it satisfies this quadruple condition. The only disadvantage right now is that it's not complete. I will come to this later. Why is this inequality true? And I'm, I will sketch you the proof. So this is the only proof which I present here, but this is the main result in some sense, and the proof is not too complicated. So let us use this picture. Let us think now that these are not points, that these are the metric measure space, x0, x1, x2, x3. So we have this, we want to prove this. Now we know that between any pair of metric measure space, we have one optimal coupling. It's more precisely optimal coupling between the measures. So these are the measures uh, m bar 1, m bar 2, m bar 3. We all connect them to this center. And then uh, what we do is, um, OK, it depends on your, on your terminology. We make a disintegration of a measure with respect to this measure. So we get three Markov kernels, Markov kernel from here to here, Markov kernel from here to there, Markov kernel from here to there. We multiply these three Markov kernels and integrate them with a measure here. So in optimal transportation theorem, we simply say we glue together these measures at this measure. In probabilistic terms, you would say you take conditional expectations, conditioned on knowing what happens here. You have conditional expectations of these three random variables. You multiply them, and you put together everything. So you produce a measure on this fourfold product of a space, which is, if you project it to this, it's for coupling, projecting, it's for optimal coupling, projecting, it's for optimal coupling. And projecting it to these two factors, it produces some coupling. 
not for optimal one. Okay, now you have a measure on these fourfold space, and now you choose randomly pairs of points in each of these space according to this measure. You apply this measure twice, so you get two quadruples, two points in each space. With a pair in this space, you define the number R2, R1, and so on. So you get uh, four numbers, or distance to the Q, the Q doesn't play any role here. You get four numbers, and now you look on this inequality. I claim that this is true. So those who are good in calculus one can prove it within the next uh, two or three minutes, perhaps. Those who are not uh, willing to prove it by themselves, they can rely to the proof of uh, levita petrunin and the fact that the real line is a space of non-negative curvature. And since the real line is a space of non-negative curvature, this inequality has to be true. Because this is just a quadruple on the real line. And now the next step is you take this, again, remember that this should be the distances between pairs of points. You integrate out this xi, yi, with respect to twofold measure, twofold application of this measure. And you have essentially what you want to prove, besides the fact that this is not for optimal coupling. But choosing for optimal one makes the inequality even better. And this is the proof of non-negative curvature, which is really quite nice since it's easy and, and, uh, and it has indeed some, some nice consequences. Uh, before I come to these consequences, we should study now a little, okay, I also should say, if there are questions, please interrupt me. But some of you already have done so. So this is by no means the idea that I want to present as many results as possible. So if, and this is not a final work. So this is just a proposal that this might be a good concept for, for further result. Now the question arises, of course, what is the completion of this space? Because if I want to make really gradient flows or whatever application of uh, Alexander's geometry, I should understand the closure and the, uh, the completion. The completion turns out to be, again, a class of homomorphism classes, I call it now, of metric measure spaces. But I call them pseudo-metric measure space because this is now a little bit different. So x, again, is a Polish space, a complete separable metric space, but the metric which is behind this polish does not show up. Does not show up. So it's just polish in the sense there exists a complete separable metric, but this is not for D. M is a Borel probability measure on the topology of X, and now D is just a L2 function. For simplicity, I assume Q is one, so this makes it easier. Uh, this Q. If Symmetric, satisfying the triangle inequality. It follows from the triangle inequality. <laughs> yeah, at least almost everywhere. Yeah, you, you, can, you can also add non-negative. This does not make. Yes. It, it's complete, separable, metrizable. Yes. I, I don't fix the, the metric which makes it to a metric space. I just want to distinguish this from the metric measure space, which I have defined by saying that this D is the metric for the Polish space. I call this pseudo-metric measure space because D is not a Polish metric. It's not really a metric. D is just a function. Uh, triangle inequality is true, but for instance, um, yeah. It, no, no, uh, wait, wait a moment. No, no. No, no. I, I just want, want to give you an example. Just take this space for unit square and take the metric which measures only x1, uh, x1 coordinate. This would be a pseudometric. And, and I want to be safe. This is not a metric because yeah, it's, it, it does not induce the topology. It satisfies triangle inequality. It's non negative. It's symmetric. So, but zero metric, I think various people use it in, in various ways, so. Yeah. No, no, this is very similar to, uh, and, and yeah, we already discussed about this triangle inequality. Yeah, yeah. 
No, this is not continuous. It's measurable. It's an L2 function. L2 means measurable. But it typically, it will be not continuous. Actually, if it's almost everywhere, also needs some more precise definition. But uh, I simply can tell you all versions which you can have in mind are equivalent. But the equivalence is non-trivial. One of his statements is, is there, is there one metric which coincides almost everywhere? And almost everywhere, of course, a priori would be on the product space. It would have two variables. For triangle inequality, you need three variables. So already this requires some thought what, what, what is really the meaning of this. But it is, it is in a consistent way. And these are partly recent results of uh, Vashik and, and co-authors, and OK, partly also from my paper. Uh, D is not continuous. And it does not, it, it's highly degenerate, like in this pa picture, uh, if you only measure distance in one direction. Uh, and homomorphism simply say, OK, first of all, you can extend all these concepts to, to these functions. Because here, you measure just LP distance between some functions. Nobody cares about continuity. And uh, we, we say simply, and now I call it homomorphism class, yeah, because the classical unit interval now is homomorph to this space. I do not want to say isomorph, because isomorph are really spaces which, in the classical sense, are via bijective map between the supports, and this is not the case. So the classical unit interval in this case would be equivalent or uh, homomorph to this space. And it simply means that this distance is zero. It also means that you will find an optimal coupling such that these two distances coincide for almost every choice of pairs of points. Now you, you have to choose two pairs of points, and these two distances, yeah, you choose uh, points here and there, and you would not see any difference. You can couple. Yeah, coupling here would simply mean you project this mesh, measure down. This is your coupling. Um, so you mean this space here, this? No, OK, first of all, it's, it's just an infinite dimensional Alexander space. But locally, I will explain one re representation. Maybe it's sufficient for, for your intuition. Uh, uh, OK, it will come on, on this slide now, exactly. So this is just a, uh, once more of a statement from before. And now one way, perhaps, which helps you to get another view on this space is that this space of all pseudometric measure space is isomorphic to the L2 space on the unit square with a Lebesgue measure model of the action of some symmetry group. It's not really a group, but it's, it's like, like the action of a group. And I will try to explain this a little bit more in detail. So I here is the unit interval, so it's the unit square with a Lebesgue measure on the unit interval. This delta stands for triangle inequality plus non-negativity. Uh, and I want to study symmetric functions. Again, ignore the Q. It's easier for you if, if you get rid of this Q. Uh, and I perhaps also drop it in my, in my formulation of the results. Uh, this space inf are the measure preserved in maps from the unit interval to the unit interval. So they preserve the Lebesgue measure. And this is an infinite dimensional version of a permutation group in some sense. So for discrete model, I also will present your discrete model. In the discrete model, this will be the permutation group of endpoints. And the action of this, and yeah, the permutation group is a group, but this 
is not a group. This has to do with the fact that you do not work with bijections. We uh, work with, with couplings. So measure preserving composed with measure preserving is, of course, measure preserving, but you don't have an inverse. There might be measure preserving maps which, which uh, double points. And now the action uh, of this, of this uh, semi-group on L2 is as follows. If you have such a measure preserving map, you just take the uh, pullback of the L2 map. And the fact that this phi is measure preserving simply tells you that this guy has uh, the same L2 norm and the same size and so forth. So this is just, the, if you integrate this with, with respect to VSDT, the measure preserving just tells you it's the same as before. And why, why is, is this space isometric? So these are now two metric spaces, and we want to prove that they are isometric. Of course, this is now not a real proof. A proof has to take into account more precise arguments, but this is more intuitive argument why one should, uh, un why one can understand this, this isometry. How do we come from this space to the space of metric measure space? Okay, here we simply have to uh, convince ourselves that an F in this L2 space is a good candidate for a pseudometric in this space. Yeah, these are L2 maps which satisfy the triangle inequality. And as I mentioned, forget the Q. Then F is just this pseudometric. You take the unit interval with this, with this uh, pseudometric the Lebesgue measure, and you have one representative of a class which is an element in this uh, uh, completion of, of X bar. And the other way around, of course, is more challenging, but again, this is a, this is a well known approach uh, using the parametrization of a measure. Whenever you have a, a polished space and a measure on that, we ignore the distance at the moment, we have a polished space with a measure on it, then there exists a phi from the unit interval which allows to represent this measure as per push forward of a Lebesgue measure. So this is what Vashi Gromov uh, used very intensively for the reconstruction theorem and other problems, but which is also well known in some sense for each uh, teacher in probability that every probability measure is the push forward under the right inverse of its distribution function. Push forward of a Lebesgue measure under the right inverse of its distribution function. So this is what, what is uh, well known. Now we have this phi. This phi is by no means unique. And now we take this phi and uh, pull back the distance uh, from this space to produce a distance on the unit interval. Or if it's not a distance, then it's a pseudo distance, whatever. The D is not necessarily uh, continuous, but this is not the problem. It was measurable and it will be measurable. So now we have a pseudo metric on the unit interval, and this is now our representative of a metric measure space in the sense of this homomorphism. Of course, you know, uh, you can represent this guy here, and the maps are, of course, highly discontinuous, which, which do the job, and they are by, by no means unique. But the non-uniqueness is uh, factored out by the action of this group. So, so the, the non-uniqueness, which comes with a phi, this essentially sits here. And then if you make this in detail, you see this is really the isometry between the metric spaces. In the not caring what, whether this is a space of spaces, whatever, these are just two metric spaces and there is a uh, bijection. So the completion is then an Alexander space and uh, there is nothing to prove because these quadruple inequalities extend from the space to the completion. This is, again, an advantage of quadruple inequalities. If you have these quadruple inequalities as a characterization of curvature, they, they are preserved under Cauchy limits. So there is nothing. It, it would be more complicated if we, if we use triangle comparison because then we have to think are there new geodesics, what happens, and so on. And now, if we have curvature bounds, then there is a well developed theory by Petruni and Lutschak and many other people. Uh, hopefully, I um, well, certainly I forgot important names. Uh, which already prove the existence of geodesics, the existence of tangent space, the existence of exponential map, and uh, what I'm most interested in, the existence of gradient flows. For whenever you have a Lipschitz continuous function, which is kappa convex, kappa convex should mean lower bound on a 
Hessian in some sense. Uh, then there exists a unique gradient flow, downward gradient flow. So in analysis, typically people ask for downward gradient flow. Uh, therefore, convexity in, in geometry, actually they ask for upward gradient flow and have concavity. Uh, and so this formally makes sense, and it there's a unique flow. Of course, this flow can get stuck very soon. Whenever you have a critical point of this function, it gets stuck, but okay, you cannot do better. And you have this Lipschitz estimate. So the convexity of a, of a function, k could be positive or negative, typically it will be negative. So then it's, it's not a, really a contraction, it's an expansion bound. But of course, this is, this is very interesting. If you have two spaces which are close together at time zero, then they will be close together at time one. Perhaps not as close as in the beginning, but this is far away from what we know from Ritchie flow. Now, if you have a small metric perturbation of a manifold, of course, you don't have any information what, what, what happens after time one. Uh, but this is one of these advantages if you, if you manage to prove convexity estimates for a given function, then you have a, a good understanding of what's, what's going on. Uh, yeah, perhaps I, yeah, okay, depends a little bit. I can tell you also some extension physics for me. Okay, let, let me say a little bit why I make this extension. I try to understand what, what I, I really fed geodesics of these spaces, and it turns out that there are two effects which make things complicated. If we go to back to our L2, okay. So our L2 setting, there are two effects. One effect comes from the action of this kind of symmetry group. And this can be understood uh, quite well, I would claim. And then there is another effect which comes from the constraint of a triangle inequality. And this essentially is just a convex constraint. Yeah? You can say this defines a convex set in a bigger space. And there is, at the moment, I can. I would say you cannot say much more than there is a convex set and it has a boundary. And if a gradient flow runs in the boundary, okay, you have a boundary. Then no better information is possible. But if you uh, ask for the action of this in symmetry group, you can give a better interpretation. Of course, you can think of a fundamental domain. You reach the boundary. But this could be understood in terms of gradient flow. And in order to understand this, I discuss a little bit what happens if we give up the triangle inequality. This is just uh, this is not in order to study this space by itself, but just to understand what what happens. So now we, we what we call gauge measure space. We give up the triangle inequality and for positivity, and uh, so if it would be would satisfy triangle inequality, we would be in the previous space again. This is uh, there is a similar definition called just this f not this f one. Again, this is uh, uh, non-negatively curved space. And again, the invariance group uh, acts on this. And for this, we have an expression of a tangent of a tangent space. The tangent space in a given metric measure space. For simplicity, let us assume that this is a representative without atoms. Uh, is then just the L2 space of symmetric function on the product space. And how does the such a tangent space act? It simply, yeah. The exponential map in a given space x, represented by x not f not x f not and m, means that you add this to the distance function. And you immediately can see that typically it's hard to believe that adding a function to a distance function preserves the triangle inequality. But sometimes it's possible. For instance, you can add epsilon times the distance itself. And in this setting, you can describe very precisely uh, what, what happens then? So the L2 space, uh, the tangent space is this L2 space modulo uh, symmetry group or isotropy, isotropy group. And this is in the sense of this uh, singular space is uh, the space of optimal couplings of a space itself which do not cost anything. Yeah, for instance, this space has one non-trivial element, namely identifying the left with the right hand side. You can make this, uh, this mirror here. You map these two points to these two points. It preserves the distance. Preserving the distance means producing no cost. So this is the metric version 
an optimal coupling of a, of a measure with itself, if it's optimal, it, it must produce zero costs. Because the identity would be one coupling which produces no cost. And any other coupling which produces no cost is in the symmetry group. So this is a way to, to decide whether this space has a non-trivial symmetry group or not. If it has a non-trivial symmetry group, then the, L2 spa the tension space is not L2, but the quotient. Because if, if you have this space, if you want to deform something, then the symmetric operation produces the same object. So there are two directions which, which have to be identified. Okay, and if there are no symmetries, the tangent space is indeed an L2 space. Uh, and there is another object which helps a little bit to understand what's going on. These are the so-called endpoint spaces. These are metric measure spaces where the mass is uniformly distributed on n points. So n is fixed now. So we fix n. The mass is uniformly distributed. So the only information which remains is the distance matrix between the endpoints. So it's an n cross n matrix, symmetric, vanishing on the diagonal. So it has n over 2 non-trivial entries. And uh, if we want to have a triangle inequality, it, this entries should satisfy the triangle inequality. And the natural distance here is then again, um, or not again, is then the distance, the Euclidean distance on this Euclidean space dimension n over 2 between one matrix and the other matrix, but we allow the second matrix to change the coordinates, which means we relabel the points. This is for optimal coupling. Yeah? Here we have points x1 up to xn. The second space has points y1 up to yn, but of course we can replace this y1 up to yn by y of sigma i. And this action of a, permit of a symmetry group, this is now just, is there another slide? No. This is, this is now exactly what, in the infinite dimensional case, is the semi group of measure preserving maps on the unit level. And again, here you would see why it is no surprise that this space is non negatively curved, because you have a L2 space or Euclidean space, which has by definition curvature zero. And you have a, you, you produce the quotient space by a, group of uh, isometries, and this preserves lower curvature bounds. Yeah? Non-negatively curved space, quotient produces a non-negatively curved space. And in our previous slide, we had L2, which is flat. Any LP, of course, would have no curvature. Therefore, P equal 2 is the only case. So here, this P, P equal 2 is the only case which produces curvature. Every other exponent would, would not allow for geometric interpretation. OK, now I skip this, so there's an epsilon length which allows to go more to a geodesic interpolation between spaces. And now I present two functions uh, on this space of metric measure space which allow to, to calculate the curvature, uh, not the curvature, the, the Hessian, in order that we have uh, control of a, of a gradient flows. One example is, uh, the following function, so it's um, a function on n points in some sense. So you fix a, f a number n, and you fix a function on the space of n cross n matrices. And you do the following, you choose n points. So m to the n should be the n-fold product of a measure. You choose randomly n points. You build out the distance matrix out of these n points and you plug it in this smooth function. So this is exactly the core of a reconstruction theorem. Sampling endpoints, but n is fixed here. Sampling endpoints, using the distance matrix as an element in, in Euclidean space, and choosing any function on this uh, high dimension Euclidean space. And since the geodesic in this space of metric measure space is a convex combination. If you, if you want to look on this function along geodesics, it means there is a dt here, a t here. And it's just a convex combination of distances. So as a function of t, it simply means it's d not to the power q plus uh, 1 minus t plus, plus t times t1 to the q. So the dependence on t is, is extremely simple. 
So it's u of something which is linear in t. So if you can differentiate u, then you can differentiate everything. And you can write down the uh, derivatives of any order. As long as you know how the uh, geodesics look like. Therefore, what I dealt with was this understanding of these convex constraints and symmetry group and so forth. So, uh, and if n is 4, we already learned that such a function is good to characterize curvature. Yeah, for instance, you can take this kind of quadruple inequality, take the difference between left and right hand side, positive part, this is one of these functions. And if it's, yeah, it, if it has a sign, you are in, in whatever bad situation. And, uh, okay. And this way, uh, constructing these kind of functions, you finally can prove the following. Uh, for each n, there exists a semi-convex Lipschitz continuous function such that uh, the only minimizer of this function is for the round sphere. And the last um, construction which I want to pre present, so this, this uses this sampling of points and Another idea to produce functions which are semi-convex uh, use for IDF that a good indicator for metric measure space to be close to a given manifold, for instance, is that it has a similar volume growth. So if, uh, so if this is a nice metric quantity, you look on the volume of balls standard at x with radius r. And this is, this is a property which depends on the isomorphism class, not on the representative. Now we give ourselves a model space, for instance, for round sphere in dimension 13. Perhaps this is our favorite space. And we want to construct a flow which deforms each space into the round sphere of dimension 13. So uh, this is our model space. It has a certain volume growth, which shows up here. And now for a given space, we calculate the volume growth, so the volume of balls. We look for the difference between the volume of a model space and our given space integrate several times to make it a little bit smoother, squared, and then we have a function which has a minimizer in exactly these points which have the same volume growth as the seven-dimensional sphere. And if we, or 13, and if, if we do this for spheres of dimension one, two, three, four, then this characterizes uniquely for a round sphere among the manifolds. And uh, why is this also, or why could this be perhaps a, a core for more interesting uh, ongoing work? This is in some sense not too far away from the Einstein-Hilbert functional. So if you look on this on small scales, uh, if you do integrate up to epsilon, and now if we let epsilon go to zero, so epsilon is, is the maximum radius of, of balls which we consider in this construction here. If for small radius, we look on this, it's not hard to see that for manifolds, this converges to the difference of a scalar curvature. Because the volume growth of balls is determined for small on small scales by the, or the deviation from the, from the Euclidean volume depends on the scalar curvature. So we have a scalar curvature of a space where we are. We have a scalar curvature of our model space. And uh, the limit as uh, already go to zero is just this difference of this scalar curvature squared. And uh, we know if we drop this uh, normalization by S star and the square, then this, the gradient flow for this would lead to the Ricci flow. And uh, if we would look on this in the geometry of three many manifolds, which has a completely different tangent structure, it would lead to a, a slight modification of Ricci flow. It would not be too different. but. No, uh, okay, I sh should warn you. So if you look on this function, which is a kind of gamma limit of this, but not, nothing has proven this, but, but it's just a, in a naive sense, this is a limit. And if you look on this function now, not in this geometry of metric measure space, which I have presented, but if you look on this function on the standard geometry of space of three many manifolds, and the gradient flow for this is just a small uh, modification of Ricci flow. It's Ricci for flow times this is a prefactor, which is not the right hand side. Uh, because you differentiate this, you get two times this times the derivative, and the derivative gives the, the Ricci flow. 
but it's, it's not rigid flow what we study. So, so I want to avoid any, any misunderstanding. Okay, what, what is uh, FIS now? Okay, FIS is again going back to FIS uh, functional from here, in some sense what I already said. Uh, FIS function, which I've presented before, uh, achieves this minimizer if and only if uh, space in which we are has, the, has exactly the same volume growth as the model space and for dimension up to three, we know that this happens and if the model space is around sphere, then this happens if and only if the given space is around sphere. So this gives a unique characterization of, of, of model spaces. Uh, unfortunately, so this is, a, this is not really known in higher dimension, even if there is a good uh, short time asymptotic of volume growth, but um, yeah, several things remain to be proven also in this respect. But these functions are just examples which should demonstrate that it's possible to explicitly write down semi-convex functions on this space. Okay, thanks for your attention.
from triple to here. What we can say about this map? And they prove that this is, in natural sense, Lipschitz map, mm. not, on, not on only Lipschitz, not more. And uh, I, I didn't tell you that, that, that this is uh, complete description. So this is, uh, this measure gives you complete invariance. So this is isomorphism between that space and space of such a measure. And uh, this map is uh, and so on. So I think that it's important because measure on the measure of what does it mean? This is a measure on distance matrix. We have distance matrices. This is natural. This is infinite matrix. And you have a random map, uh, matrix, random matrix, very popular also. So every property of this space we can uh, describe in some of this nature. So this is a, but of course I am very impressed by uh, what you told about the uh, differential structure of this, and this is very important. Also I want to say that our last paper that was which I mentioned, we consider more, uh, more, more concrete ge geometry of this uh, triple and it happened that it's a very nice connection with Tobolev uh, theory of this triple gives you a new look on the Tobolev uh, embedding theorem of Tobolev uh, mm -hmm. so, so this is uh, in a sense based on the uh, more Perhaps I, I, I can raise one, one challenge for, I don't know, perhaps it's, it's in the interest of your field. What I tried, or what we tried also, was to find a natural measure on this space. So if I this L2 space, model of this. And then in some sense, the natural measure would be here for white noise. It would be invariant under this, it would be consistent with this group. But white noise is not very interesting. And if you start with white noise, white noise is not even, it's, it's a badly. Is <laughs> Sorry, so this is this, this invariance uh, group on this Lebesgue measure. We want to have a, a natural measure on this space. It's fair. Uh, because these finite dimensional models, these are finite dimensional Alexandrov spaces. And it's just for Euclidean space model or with a convex boundary. Action of the invariance group, so the natural measure is the Lebesgue measure on these finite dimensional models, there is no doubt. It's just a flat Euclidean measure. If we pass to a limit, we wouldn't end up with this if we give up the trying linear quality. But this is highly singular. It's a distribution of negative order. To impose the trying linear quality later on does not make sense because almost each triple does not satisfy triangle inequality if you choose randomly. So the point would be we should start immediately with a triangle inequality on finite dimensional models. Again, this is Lebesgue measure. The question is, does this has a limit? So is there a natural measure on this space of L2 function, which satisfies the triangle inequality? A natural measure, which on finite dimensional model would be consistent with a Lebesgue measure. So it could exist. So without this, it does not make sense. And imposing this convex constraint later would mean you impose a, a constraint which lives on a, a zero set. It would be too small, this set. Okay, just for the next days to 